This country is, in spite of our recent chaos, is on balance pretty likely to go to the FBI compared to, to most institutions and groups. Some people don't give in to the dollar sign. They uh, are hooked by ideology. It happened to Lee Harvey uh, Oswald. He was a very, very pointed and enthusiastic killer. And he was to assassinate Kennedy and return uh, back to Moscow uh, and have there be cheering and enthusiasm for him at the Moscow airport. How did Stalin's leaders that were left after he died in the mid 50s, how did they feel about Kennedy? Khrushchev, he wanted Kennedy dead, but he realized that he might get caught and labeled as the assassin of the American president. And that could mean nuclear war between the US and the Soviet Union. Interesting. He changed and the decision was made by Oswald not to listen and not to obey anybody. And he basically executed him. My guest today is the former 16th director of CIA, Mr. James Wolsey. And we have a lot of interesting topics and experiences that he's had that we're going to get into today. With that being said, James, thank you so much for being a guest on Vitamin. Thank you. Great to be with you. So it's, it's uh, uh, you know, anytime I've had, I remember one time I had a uh, uh, CIA agent, we were running a uh, executive meeting with a company called Vistage, and I was the host. I had to bring somebody in as a guest. And it was a former CIA agent. He came in. Every single CEO and entrepreneur showed up because they just wanted to hear the different stories. And uh, uh, it was by far the most popular guest we had where CEOs wanted to hear from a CIA agent. Go figure why a CEO, but it's exciting to share your story with our audience. So, you know, if we can go back uh, uh, on how you got started, how does one go from, you know, graduating from high school to saying, I want to go be a CIA agent? And then not only that, you get a phone call from Bill Clinton saying, hey, I want to meet with you. And that leads to you being the director of CIA. So how did this whole thing get started for you? Well, uh, it was close to being an accident. Um, what uh, happened was uh, that uh, I was a conservative Democrat, uh, still kind of am. Uh, and uh, I think the administration, as, uh, the, uh, 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 as, as the administration came into its position with the new administration, uh, uh, they wanted uh, to have probably all parts of the system of the political system represented. And uh, they didn't have any conservative Democrats. And so they named me, but they hadn't done their research all that thoroughly. And uh, they announced me as Admiral uh, Woolsey. And um, I said, you know, I never was an admiral, uh, uh, never got above captain in the army. And uh, they had a crowd gathered by that point uh, uh, to hear the announcement. And they, one of the staffers said, whoops, we better change the press release. Uh, so I was a, a last minute uh, uh, conservative Democrat. Uh, and uh, that's uh, why I think they uh, uh, searched for me and, uh, and found me. And it was not uh, a, a real uh, polished uh, operation. Very, very interesting. By, by the way, who would you say because, uh, you know, you don't hear that term too often today. Who would you say is a current conservative Democrat? And would you put JFK as a conservative Democrat? I would have at the time, yes. Uh, uh, the last one, I, I think, probably was Joe Lieberman. He's often, often named as that. Uh, but Joe is retired. As a matter of fact, the last time I called myself a Joe Lieberman Democrat, Joe was in the group with me. He said, Jim, you've got to stop saying that. I'm not in politics anymore. I said, you know, Joe, if I can't be a conservative Democrat and call myself a Lieberman uh, Democrat, I'll, uh, I'll go back to Harry. Harry Truman was a good president. Why not use him? So, uh, <laughs> but in any case, <laughs> it's conservative Democrat it is. Conservative Democrat. Conservative Democrat. Do, do, we, do we have a lot of current conservative Democrats, would you say? Uh, maybe two. Uh, no, not so much. Uh, I think the uh, Democrats uh, have uh, yawed uh, over into uh, being progressives, uh, largely, and uh, the Republicans uh, have uh, gotten uh, very much uh, into, uh, I think, uh, some of the innovations of uh, uh, 
to how to how to create a new movement for themselves. And uh, I'm not sure uh, there are any uh, conservative Democrats. I think they're kind of gone with the wind. You said two of them. Is Manchin one of them? Is that who you're thinking is one of them? I would say Manchin, and I still count to Lieberman. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay, very, I'm very. I mean, you know, if you think about it, a lot of people would probably be. Uh, America probably would be comfortable with uh, someone more on the center left or center right than being far left or far right. Uh, uh, you know, it, it would balance out the eagle's wings if somebody was more on the center left or right rather than going far to the right or left. I think you're right. Yeah. So so how was that phone call made when you got the call and saying, hey, the president wants to meet with you? And were you expecting it? I know you said it was kind of a surprise, but was it something where you were on a short list of five names that you knew about? Not really. Um, I was on a short list uh, of people that they were talking to, but I thought they were just talking to a group of people who were being considered to be director, not uh, who had uh, already been chosen as an admiral <laughs> to uh, to be director. Um, it was, uh, it turned out I was on a shorter list than I knew. How, how was your first sit down with uh, President Clinton? Well, we, uh, we really didn't uh, uh, sit down. Uh, uh, it, uh, it happened very quickly. Uh, uh, President Clinton uh, uh, chatted with me uh, at the inauguration uh, ceremony for a few seconds. Uh, that's about it. Yeah, I, I heard uh, you tell a joke one time. You said, you know, in the two years of me being the director of CIA, you know, the plane that uh, tried to fly into the Pentagon or White House, that was actually me trying to get a meeting with the president because yeah. you, he wouldn't sit down with you. Well, that's basically true. Uh, Bill Clinton was, was is a speed reader, and uh, so he didn't want to sit down every morning and have the director of central intelligence uh, read uh, uh, sheets of paper to him. Uh, he can he could read a lot faster himself, and so uh, he uh, would just uh, let the system uh, operate. And he's a speed reader, so he occasionally. You wouldn't know what he was reading, but I remember one time he said, Jim, have you uh, read that uh, uh, new book uh, on Africa by uh, uh, so-and-so? Um, what did you think of it? And I, I happily had read it, uh, but uh, he was reading a lot of books as, as present and uh, uh, talking to people about them. But uh, it wasn't very formal and he didn't, he didn't want there to be any uh, nod toward uh, toward uh, uh, having a system of, of reviewing is that is that a protocol like typically the president's first meeting is to get a briefing by the director of CIA every morning is that typically historically what it's been what's been the case or no it's happened and it's, it's been the case several times I think but it's it's there's nothing required about it got uh, it the president uh, designates the director as director and the director uh, gets briefed on this panoply of uh, briefs and then starts or started the uh, meeting uh, with the president the next uh, day. Uh, but that's that changed uh, in part with me. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I wonder. I mean, if you're a president, you would want to meet with the director of CIA to kind of see what's going on. If it's not once a day, maybe once a week to just kind of be brief, uh, uh, especially when you say in two years, you never got a chance to meet with them. Uh, but, were you reporting Did he, kind of like, you know how you run a company and sometimes you put your org chart together and you say, look, I'm the CEO. I have the CFO, the COO, the CIO, the CTO, whatever. And I got five direct reports. Typically, the CEO doesn't want to have more than five reports. Sometimes it's seven, but let's just say five is the magical number. Were you reporting to the chief of staff? Did he want you to go through another layer before you go through him? Who were you directly reporting to? Functionally, yes. Uh, Tony okay. was chief of staff, uh, and he uh, he liked it if the president would report to him, and that was kind of the way it, it, it worked out. It wasn't absolutely a rule. And when we would uh, go in uh, together, uh, Tony and I, to uh, 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 say something uh, uh, to the president, I was, it was okay with them as we walked out, if I stopped by the president's desk and said, uh, Mr. President, do you want to pay particular attention to 
X and Y in the report today. Uh, it was that sort of thing that's fine. Got it. So day before you became the director of CIA versus the day after, the day you became a director of CIA, what were some of your responsibilities? How dramatically did your responsibilities change the day after becoming the C director of CIA? Well, I think the main change uh, is the change from being just a reporter of intelligence to being um, in a situation where you can recommend and sometimes get approved covert actions. A covert action uh, is an event that's put together in order to try to influence what the policy is rather than just report on it. And it's not, there's nothing sneaky about it from the point of view of the president not knowing about it. The president fully briefed and he gets a signed uh, recommendation uh, for, from the uh, director and uh, uh, it uh, all is proper and done. But it, um, is a, it, it, it's an action item. And uh, that sometimes those are successful and sometimes they're not. And uh, uh, Bill McClinton, was very uh, disturbed, uh, he said one time in a, in a close meeting, um, that uh, he had not gone into Rwanda uh, and uh, stopped the uh, Hutus uh, killing of uh, other Rwandan tribes. Um, it was uh, really, uh, the Tutsis uh, were massacred essentially during the Rwanda killing fields uh, of late uh, uh, 93, 94. And um, that, uh, what, what I think President Clinton didn't want to have is that he did not want another uh, event like uh, the Black Hawk Down where American troops got killed uh, on the ground in Somalia. And, and so he was being very cautious and he did not stop the uh, Rwandan uh, Hutus from killing the Tutsis. And he was very, as he thought about it over time, he decided that had been a big mistake. And he would often tell people, and this is one thing I, I rather admire about Clinton. He would tell people, okay, you need to know the biggest mistake I made as president. It was going, not going in and protecting the, the Tutsis. I should never have let them massacre the Hutus. Um, and most all presidents don't do things like that. They, they don't say right out in the National Security Council meeting, you know, I made a big mistake and here's what it was. Because that was close to a million people that died um, as a result of that decision of his. And it's um, um, something that uh, has come up in time, a number of circumstances. Uh, but uh, it's um, an important issue, and, and it's something that I, he had the, the the manhood and grace to uh, to deal with uh, straightforwardly. Was was that during your time when a million people died during his watch? Was it when you were his director of CIA, or was it afterwards? Uh, it was largely uh, during about ninety four, and right. I was director in ninety three to ninety five. Got it. Do you think it could have been prevented if he was communicating with you more often and getting updates or it wouldn't have made a difference? I don't think uh, the decision about going in to uh, protect the Tootsies or not uh, would have changed uh, uh, based on who was director. He, he just didn't want to do that. So uh, uh, so it wouldn't have made a difference whether uh, you would have given him the briefing or not because he was uh, determined not to make the move. And But he admitted to the fact that that decision was a decision he made that cost a million people's lives. So he took responsibility for it, which is what great leaders do. So, you know, prior to being a director of CIA, how much experience did you have being a CIA agent yourself? When I went on active duty in the army uh, to um, um, pull out, fulfill my uh, requirements uh, as a as an infantry officer uh, in the, uh, the reserve officers training corps requirements, uh, I uh, had a choice whether to work on intelligence uh, issues or uh, work on issues related to the Vietnam War. Since I had been a, a founder and president 
of Yale Citizens for Eugene McCarthy for president and had opposed uh, the Vietnam War. I, I picked intelligence rather than the Vietnam War. And uh, I uh, uh, worked on intelligence matters uh, largely um, um, having to do with satellite uh, design, reconnaissance satellite. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I did that for close to two years. And then after that, I began uh, doing some uh, National Security Council work for uh, Brent Scowcroft uh, and uh, uh, worked uh, uh, in the Pentagon. Uh, so, um, it was in the technical side of things uh, and was uh, relatively short, a couple of years. Uh, but uh, uh, I, uh, that, that's what my experience was. Yeah, I mean, I look at your r resume. Advisor during a military U.S. delegation for strategic arms, limitation talks in uh, Vienna, 1969 to 1970. General counsel to U.S. Senate Committee on Armed Services, 7073. Un Under Secretary of the Navy, 77 and 79, delegate at large of the U.S. Soviet Strategic Arm Reduction Talks and Nuclear and Space Arms Talks, Geneva, 1983 to 86, ambassador to the negotiation on conventional armed forces in Europe, Vienna, 89 to 91. So it's interesting that you had a variety of background on different things today. Does that kind of give you an edge on why they thought about recruiting you to be the director of CIA? It's possible. Okay. Uh that uh, reasonably broad experience, uh, although not uh, deep and not real lengthy. I mean, it was screened over two, three year set of assignments. When you became a director of CIA, were you given some intel where you yourself were, you thought the uh, outcome or the blame was somebody and then you found out it was somebody else where you sat there and said, I, this is pretty interesting on the intel that was given on what event took place here. Was there anything that you yourself were extra curious about that as a director of CIA, now you can have access to find out more about that information? Yes, uh, drones. I uh, was a, uh, an enthusiast uh, for uh, making a transition for at least an important portion uh, of the photo reconnaissance uh, uh, part of the agency and the Pentagon uh, that would have been backed up the idea of relying more heavily on, uh, on drones. As a matter of fact, uh, in the early mid uh, 80s, um, before I uh, uh, became a uh, General Counsel of the Senate Armed Services uh, Committee. Uh, I I was a, a private citizen doing one thing and another, and I got asked to come over to Israel uh, to uh, uh, work with the IDF, and uh, I did things like that from from time to time. And uh, because I was over there, I saw something that I was really impressed by, which was a um, essentially a group of very young Israeli uh, troops uh, flying drones, uh, which I hadn't seen before in the American military, flying drones. And uh, they seemed like they were just almost certainly too young to be doing things with military forces. Um, and so I asked the colonel who was in charge of the Israeli uh, uh, unit. Um, I said, uh, Colonel, this is uh, really an interesting operation. You've got these uh, young uh, uh, troops uh, flying uh, drones and they're uh, sh shooting down uh, uh, tank uh, uh, ordnance uh, from uh, 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 above, above them. Uh, there's just a lot here going on. Um, what are, what's going on? Why do you have just a very young uh, uh, troops doing something like this? It looks like it's uh, hard to do and, and important and, and, and difficult. And the Colonel grinned and he said, well, he said they ought to be fairly young. Uh, he said, this is the uh, uh, Israeli team that essentially does uh, operations uh, in training, and uh, the reason they're uh, they're young is that this is the Israeli model airplane club, and we just put them into uniform and uh, uh, called them up, and they're doing a great job. And I, I remember thinking that's that that's smart. 
that's uh, you got a whole new way of using ordinance and different uh, new ordinance. So you go to the 14 year olds and sure enough, they're doing a great job. Very interesting. You know, I recently interviewed the former director of a Mossad, Shabtai Shavit. I don't know if you are familiar with Shabtai Shavit. I just went to a, a conference that, where he was speaking and I introduced him. Uh, he was a good friend for the uh, two years. Uh, uh, we were both uh, uh, heads of our services. I bet. And the question I have for you is when I asked him a question, I said, look, everybody is trained by somebody, right? Like I'm from Iran. So the Savak was trained by MI6 and Secret Service and a little bit of, you know, the Mossad. You know, you think about, uh, uh, you know, uh, MI6 was trained by U.S. CIA and CIA was also trained a little bit by MI6 and kind of share each other what they know, maybe not all the secrets. The question I asked them, who, who trained Mossad to be as good as they are? You know, so I'm curious to know who you would say trained the Mossad to be as creative and as, uh, you know, some would say brutal as they are. Uh, I think it's more uh, uh, cross-referenced uh, really than that. Uh, uh, I, I, I think the CIA and including the NSA, which does some very useful and important uh, work, the uh, code breakers, um, I think that they um, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, MI6 uh, Brits uh, and uh, the CIA uh, work with one another very readily and very easily. Uh, uh, and uh, they also work very closely with the uh, called the I-5, uh, the Commonwealth uh, 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 intelligence uh, uh, troops, uh, the Australians and the New Zealanders and the, the Brits and so forth. Um, so um, it's more a group of six or eight that work together on all those sorts of things all the time than it is a, a single sequence. Why, why would why would the secret intelligence groups teach each other their tactics of what they do? Why would Basically, it's because we have uh, no major secrets anyway uh, from the, the Brits and the Canadians and the Aussies. Uh, we, uh, we're all in the same, uh, same ballpark. Who's one you wouldn't be comfortable sharing secrets with? If you were to say there's no way in the world we would do anything with the following three, who, who would it be? That would be Iran, Iran, Iran. <laughs> <laughs> So Iran's at the top. So you're, you're more uncomfortable with teaching Iran anything than China. I think China's uh, doing a clinic right now around the world with people. No, China's doing a lot and they are they worry me and the Russians worry me. I'd say I'd say realistically, uh, Russia, China, uh, uh, Iran um, are uh, Syria, uh, any of the countries that are uh, clearly uh, at odds uh, uh, with us. But that's four or five. Uh, they're or a, a few that would uh, work with us, even though not all the time. Interesting. So before we get into your new book that's coming out, Operation Dragon, Inside the Kremlin's Secret War on America, uh, I, I want to kind of ask you maybe a couple other questions here regarding today's times. You know, I've asked this question from multiple different people to see what their answer would be. Uh, being a director of CIA, 93 to 95, had different issues than we're facing today than maybe in the 70s, than maybe in the 60s. It's different challenges during different decades. What, what, what concerns you the most today? I mean, I'm talking, is it cyber warfare? Is it bionuclear? Is it nuclear? Is it, you know, bio warfare? Is it uh, uh, a uh, uh, oil war that could take place? Is it, you know, what, what is the top concern that you have with all the different challenges we're facing today? Well, it's tough because it's a combination uh, on the one hand of, uh, of uh, intelligence uh, forces or groups. I mean, I'm much more worried about uh, Iran than I uh, am uh, about most any other country. And, and in, in, but in addition to naming some names like Iran, um, I'm, uh, I'm uh, really quite uh, uh, concerned uh, about the speci specialities that have been uh, adopted by uh, well, Russia and China, uh, which uh, are are very very troubling because 
Russia, for example, has been working very hard on uh, cyber, particularly artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, that, that uh, is uh, a continuing source of uh, uh, confusion and uh, difficulty for the United States because uh, uh, the, the Russians uh, uh, lie, cheat, and steal about who they are. And uh, that uh, makes it very difficult. Uh, what do you do to somebody with a face mask that's extremely well uh, uh, designed and uh, uh, you're sure that uh, he's uh, uh, a Syrian? In fact, he may not be. He may be opposed to Syrians. I don't know. So there are um, um, a lot of... Uh, of uh, difficulties with masking and such, uh, technology, uh, cyber war in all dimensions uh, are, is really hard to deal with. Uh, and um, I'd say uh, that uh, set of, of technologies and that set of um, governments uh, are, uh, are six, eight, 10, 12, uh, really, really troubling uh, combinations of, uh, of uh, individual countries and individual uh, texts and, and uh, uh, operators. So when, when you were director of CIA from 93 to 95, uh, obviously Russia was probably your biggest threat. Would you agree Russia would be number one on the list, 93 to 95, as a nation? I think probably so. Uh, we uh, uh, we were not as uh, worried about Russia then as I think we uh, uh, should have been, um, and uh, we uh, uh, worked to some extent on uh, the uh, uh, steps uh, Russia could uh, could take uh, uh, in masking themselves and. Uh, they did that a lot. Uh, they, uh, the Temp Potemkin village uh, uh, history, uh, the disguise for a whole village uh, by uh, Count Potemkin, who was uh, Catherine the Great's uh, male friend, uh, was uh, one of the things the, the Russians uh, did and uh, did going back to the 17th century. Um, they, they were good at deception. And uh, we, uh, we were always uh, needing to uh, penetrate that. And it was not easy. D during that time, was China at all even a thought? Uh, you know, was it even something where you woke up and, you know, hey, we have to be careful what China is going to be doing next? Obviously, Russia was up there. Iran was up there. Was China still in the top three at the time or no? Uh, I don't know that it was in the top three, but it was very close. It was, it was in the top one or two or three. Uh, you can't, you can't really tell, but uh, they were a problem, but not as serious a problem, I think, we thought as, say, uh, Russia was. Now it may be different. Uh, the uh, uh, ranking of the, uh, the Chinese and Russians and Iranians, uh, uh, Syrians, uh, uh, is, is hard, hard to parse, but uh, all four or five of those uh, countries are worrisome. So, you know, uh, the one thing that sometimes I wonder about threats is when you were the director of CIA at the time, you know, the story of uh, Aldrich Ames, who was arrested February 21st, you know, 1994 for treason, spying against the United States, et cetera. So CIA was criticized for not taking action immediately. And you came out and said, I'm not the kind that's going to go out there and fire the guy. Let's investigate a little more before some find out who this guy is, if he's really involved. And then later on that year, December 28, 1994, you, you resigned. So the question I have for you with this is how, you know, you've heard the saying before, Alexander the Great, I have met the enemy, it is I, or America's biggest enemy is within the inside. In a family, the thing that could break up a great family is within the inside. How much do we have to worry about another Aldrich Ames or two or three or 10, you know, sharing some of our intel with our enemies today? We have to worry about uh, the inside. Um, it's uh, a, a serious problem. Uh, 
uh, most uh, CIA and uh, DIA and other uh, intelligence uh, people uh, or other other people on the inside, military officers and the like. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, after all, was a Marine uh, uh, sniper. Uh, so because of uh, uh, that scope, we do uh, have to uh, 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 be very careful with uh, our people, including our very senior people who uh, work on really important matters. Uh, but um, it's uh, not something that we can readily brush aside and it's also something that you want to be careful not to get too fired up about it or you you know even paranoids have real enemies uh but uh you don't want to spread a doctrine throughout the intelligence community that you're suspicious of everybody uh, you ought to be it's interesting we're c concerned and attentive about everybody but uh uh, we need our career people and we needed them badly. Yeah, I bet that's kind of weird to, you know, how do you, <laughs> how do you watch your agents and how do you, you know, uh, have detectives to detect any signs of espionage from your CIA, CIA agents who are professionals at kind of keeping things undercover and people not knowing what they do for a living. It's a tough task. I said to one of my uh, successors, and he didn't think it was a good analogy, but uh, I said it anyway in a meeting that, that um, we uh, uh, lived with a national security establishment in which we um, uh, send uh, people abroad, military usually, to fight and uh, die uh, uh, for their country. Um, we also sometimes send uh, people from my organization abroad to lie, cheat, and steal for the country. And I had uh, one of my colleagues say, we don't steal. I said, well, you know, what do, what do you call it if you get your hands on an enemy uh, draft security uh, set of fi files? Uh, you don't uh, just kind of smile and leave them there. You uh, uh, give them to the boss, find some way to use them. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the best thing that's ever been said on that, I think, is the wonderful uh, uh, Winston Churchill quote, which is that um, it is uh, so important to uh, take uh, very uh, good care of intelligence, uh, that uh, uh, it's um, a essentially like a uh, uh, dominant dominant pattern of, of, of work. What do you mean? So Churchill said it's important to carry your intelligence because they could, they could yeah, do what? Because I, they could... I think the exact quote, quote it's, uh, it's about, uh, oh, I know what it is. It's that it's uh, uh, so important. It's uh, intelligence is so important and must be protected by a bodyguard of lies. What intelligence is so important that it must be protected by the bodyguard of lies. And, and that's Winston Churchill. Wow. And, and uh, he, one of his books is called Bodyguard of Lies. Hmm. Um, and uh, it's an important uh, point. Uh, Churchill uh, uh, was very good on these issues, to put it mildly. Yeah, he's a, he's a, obviously in, in many ways, he's seen as one of the greatest leaders of all time and he's hated and he's, uh, um, you know, a lot of misconception about him and people who didn't really understand his wiring because he was a pretty weird, strong personality leader. When, you know, wartime came, they trusted him the most to want to execute. And some of the other guys like Chamberlain were not having the guts to go out there and, uh, do That's what the, the necessary work was required. But uh, going back to it, so espionage, CIA agents flipping on us, or DIA, or whoever it is that we're taking, some soldiers there, right? What is the common uh, uh, tipping point where somebody says, I'm willing to flip? Is it a, uh, is it women where, you know, they end up meeting some, you know, the stuff they see in movies, a Red Sparrow or something like that, and they, all of a sudden like, oh, shoot, I totally screwed up. 
I gave too much intel to the wrong person because this woman really was able to woo me and I'm in too deep. Is it money? Because, you know, CIA agents don't make a lot of money. If you think about the kind of money CIA agents make, it's not like they're taking home a million dollars and, you know, rolling in the dough with a Porsche 911 parked outside. That only happens in movies. Is it a deep hate for the institution and what America stands for? What what typically gets somebody want to flip against its own nation? Well, uh, lots of uh, people uh, can show weakness and uh, different types of people have and do. Uh, Ames uh, 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 came into his uh, uh, desire for uh, a great new car and a lot more money than he had. Uh, some people don't uh, uh, give in to, to uh, the dollar sign. They, uh, they uh, are uh, uh, hooked by by ideology on uh, on the other side and uh, uh that that happened again i'll use an example that heart happened to lee harvey uh, oswald he uh, was a very very pointed and enthusiastic killer and he was uh, uh, uh what he really wanted more than anything else was to assassinate kennedy and return uh, back to Moscow uh, and have there be cheering and and enthusiasm for him at the Moscow airport. Uh, he said that on several occasions. So um, people operate for strange mixtures of reasons sometimes, um, but uh, it's not always uh, 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 the happy pleasures of uh, of the friendship or it's not always the the angry pleasures of getting an added salary in your pocket it, it's uh, it's different things to different people it makes sense i mean it's it's similar temptations but you wonder how you're able to get somebody to stay loyal to an to a country and an institution when they're not making the money to not be tempted to do something otherwise um Okay, so so you know why don't we go and, and talk about uh, your book uh, and the JFK assassination and uh, you know uh, what your thoughts were on who was behind it based on access to research and folks you worked on with the book. So when you when you and I go out there and read about JFK assassination, there's a lot of different theories that come out, and you've read all the theories probably way more than any of us because you wrote a book about this and you've had to do research on it. So. Whether it's the, you know, the bullet, was it him? Was it, uh, you know, uh, uh, the mob? Was it the mafia? Was it uh, Johnson, Lyndon Johnson? Was it a couple of people that were missing politically later on? Maybe they were involved. Was it, who was it? So based on your research and theories that you have, what really happened with the JFK assassination? Well, uh, first of all, we call the book Operation Dragon. Uh, and uh, dragon in the Russian terminology a lot of the time means very effective deception. Uh, that's what they sometimes call their, their deception operations. And that um, uh, creates uh, a, a reason for them to move into both uh, trying to self-aggrandize and uh, trying to uh, help the new country or institution or group of people that they have decided to, uh, uh, unfortunately, to help. So there's, there's two batches of, uh, of people who uh, get involved in working for the other side in intelligence. And counterintelligence against them is uh, what we in the intelligence business spend a lot of time and effort uh, trying to forestall. So what conclusion did you come up with when you wrote this book with uh, former Romanian spy chief, Jan uh, Mihai Pasepa? What conclusion did you come up with uh, on who assassinated President Kennedy? It seemed reasonably clear to Mike Pacepa uh, we all called him Mike, by, by the way, because that his Romanian name with Ion Mihai is Mike. And um, we, uh, 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 I think it's 
fair to say that uh, 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 Mike uh, uh, was a Romanian patriot and did not uh, and and worked hard to help us uh, during the post-war years, the post-civil, uh, post-Cold War uh, years and during the Cold War. He worked hard to help us um, uh, corral and limit and penetrate and understand uh, the enemy. And uh, he, he and he was at the you know, thick of the fray. Um, at one point, uh, um, he uh, uh, was being chased. Uh, I don't know if his wife was in that particular uh, chase, but she, he she, he was in a, a chase with Carlos the Jackal, who had been tasked uh, to kill him. Um, and so uh, he, uh, this was a, a, a GE engineer um, uh, whose father was a general electric engineer. He worked in, in the establishment of, uh, uh, of infrastructure of, of, mm. uh, of the system. Uh, but uh, he had a flair and an ability for uh, counterintelligence that was uh, very, very effective. And uh, uh, we ended up uh, uh, being able uh, to uh, use his skills uh, effectively. And uh, uh, he uh, uh, was a, a remarkable individual. He, he passed away, by the way, a week, uh, almost exactly a week ago. He passed away exactly a week ago. Almost exactly. Wow. Um, so, so, you know, when you're sitting there and investigating this, you know, there's a lot of people, again, a lot of different uh, claims have been made on who killed JFK. Why, why specifically, like, uh, maybe I ought to ask the question a different way. What is your level of certainty on what you believe in with the events that took place with the assassination of John F. Kennedy? Um, quite high. Uh, and I have a major reason for its being quite high, and that's that I had Mike and me at um for years, spending uh, time and effort uh, cozying up uh, to uh, the Russian uh, cabinet, uh, essentially, uh, uh, chatting briefly with Khrushchev during uh, vodka breaks, uh, etc. Uh, the uh, the the whole world of essentially intelligence was open to Ch Pachepa in ways that it was not open really to virtually anybody else, and um, so that's one one thing. Uh, Mike uh, um, was able to get into contacts and. For example, Ceausescu, the Romanian intel, uh, intelligence chief, and and, and actually and and chief of uh, decision making for much of the time in Romania, Pachepa um, was a uh, 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 just a great gate into uh, into that world, and uh, uh, I think that uh, we uh, we were very lucky to have him and his very able wife um, as uh, sources uh, and, and uh, they uh, they they served us extremely well got it so so the claim you guys make you and the co-author is lee, Har lee harvey was a kgb associate who was personally instructed by soviet leader nikita khrushchev to assassinate president kennedy sometime shortly after the soviet changed their minds and oswald was told to drop the plan but oswald harboring a blinding love for all the USSR refused. So that's, that's the claim. That's the pretty much the premise of the book, but what, what, how did Stalin view uh, Kennedy? What was Stalin's relationship and view of Kennedy? Oh, he hated him with a passion because Kennedy had uh, basically made him look foolish uh, in the uh, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and, and weak. Uh, and, turning his own ships around so they wouldn't uh, confront uh, the Americans. Uh, he, uh, Khrushchev, was furious at Kennedy, and he wanted him dead, and he wanted to have him killed. Um, is that Stalin or is that Khrushchev? Who, who, who wanted him dead? 
That was Khrushchev. Uh, Stalin died in what, 53? Uh, uh, this, uh, you know, this is all post-Stalin, but not by much in the early 50s. I guess the question I would have is, Stalin's camp, you know the secret speech that Khrushchev gave, the four yeah. hours where he trashed Stalin, and Stalin is this, and Stalin is that, and Stalin is this. Stalin's people were still in power. Obviously, they were not running. It was Khrushchev, but it was Stalin's people. I'm trying to find out how did Stalin's leaders that were left after he died in the mid 50s, how did they feel about Kennedy? Well, uh, the book goes into that in some detail, Mike's in my book. Uh, they they uh, also uh, uh, wanted uh, Kennedy dead and were extremely hostile to him. And then what happened really was that, that Khrushchev finally got a little bit of balance and sense into his thick skull. Um, he um, was essentially ready he, by the 60s, early 60s, um, to move uh, against Oswald, whom he knew about and, and so forth, uh, to do something to, to create a situation where the, the, the Kennedy would be killed. Um, and uh, it was only really because of his hatred of Kennedy that he was willing to take that step. And then when he did take that step and ordered it happen, it was not necessarily face to face with uh, uh, Oswald, but, uh, but it was substantively easily known by the bureaucracy. The, the party bureaucracy that he he had given the order. He had so given the order and with such clarity that Oswald learned that he was being tasked with this great, marvelous, wonderful job that he so wanted more than anything in the world. And he essentially gets approval to move against Kennedy and the um, uh, thing, and what really happened was that uh, uh, Oswald was picked and moved against Kennedy, and then Khrushchev got a little bit of sense into his thick skull, and he wanted very much more than anybody ever has wanted a president dead. He wanted Kennedy dead, but he realized that he might get caught and labeled as the assassin of the American president. And that could mean war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, nuclear war. He decided he didn't want nuclear war. So with, with a, a sense, a real sense of unhappiness, he changed and pulled in and pulled back and, um, Khrushchev basically dictated that. And that was where things were heading when uh, the uh, decision was made by, uh, uh, by Oswald not to listen and not to obey anybody. It, it, Oswald turned around, essentially, after having been part of the group that was ordered to kill uh, Kennedy. I, Mike believes and I believe, I believe that was clearly a, a decision by Oswald to continue on and uh, kill Kennedy under a, a, a vague overall charge from Krishna. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, I've spoken to folks who I've interviewed about this topic. One is Jim Jenkins, who was one of the folks in the room who held uh, JFK's brain after he was assassinated. And he saw cuts incisions and he saw uh, bullet wounds from the back so for him you know he has no there's no way he believes anything that happened from the front you know where, from the where everyone claims it was oswald lots of people think it was cia because it was an inside job because lbj hated kennedy and you know he just wanted him gone because lbj always was more aspirational wanting to be a president than than Kennedy was, and he couldn't stand a family. He would always say, I want those Irish men out of there, and you know, I want to go in there and 
be the president and he was aspirational to want to be president, LBJ. And we all know what happened when Jen F, John F. Kennedy went up to him saying, I want you to be my VP. It was not the easiest conversation. So, But I, I, I don't think LBJ was aspirational enough to do what Khrushchev did. Uh, the, uh, the, the key uh, thing here is if one did look at the brain, uh, of Kennedy's brain, one saw something that uh, only uh, uh, the um, uh, autopsy people who work with the treasury uh, department, uh, uh, medical folks uh, saw, which uh, was that the, there's whole books on the autopsy, by the way, but the thing that you want to pay attention to is the Treasury Department study that was uh, done in order to look at the brain of Kennedy once he had been shot and to see whether or not the way the blood flowed and the soft tissue flowed was consistent with one type of approach toward uh, uh, being killed by a, a, a rifle uh, versus another type. And the Treasury Department study of this is new enough now that it hasn't been relied upon particularly uh, by the autopsy, the anti-autopsy people and the other people, the other members of the 3,000 people uh, who uh, wrote books about, uh, uh, about Kennedy. The killing of Kennedy was consistent with soft tissue being at the front end of the brain and consistent with the type of entry wound. Whereas I'll let you read all this in the treasury book because it's, it's the one that has the detail in it. But, but the, the other sort of texts of um, um, information essentially came from killing with a shot that ended up going through the much harder surface of the brain rather than the soft uh, under the skull uh, tissue. And um, I think uh, uh, it's clear from what Mike has, has told uh, us and what, what uh, I think it's clear from, the, from uh, what uh, <laughs> Chapa saw and, and passed on that the death of Kennedy was consistent and highly consistent with a bullet coming from where the bullet finally was, was said to uh, enter uh, Kennedy's uh, uh, skull. So if, if Lee, Har Lee Harvey Oswald did it, why would Ruby kill him afterwards? Like, what, what connection does Ruby have to Russia? I mean, what does Ruby have to do? Because Ruby's connection was to the mob. Uh, yeah, well, Ruby's connection was to the mob, and the mob uh, uh, ordered him uh, through Cuba uh, because they had the driving responsibility uh, for this. Uh, uh, they had, standing in line, they had people who were willing to kill Kennedy. They were ready to go, and uh, they were ready and willing to to take a, a action against uh, Kennedy, and that required them to take uh, a action against uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, because if Oswald and Oswald was still alive at that point, remember that's after one day, uh, and uh, Oswald is uh, uh, at the uh, in, at the jail. And, uh, and uh, the famous photo of Ruby shooting him in the stomach. Um, but what, uh, what happened was that uh, uh, Oswald uh, gets uh, uh, killed uh, by uh, uh, Ruby in the jail as uh, they pass by uh, one another. And uh, Ruby is killed because the, uh, neither the mafia nor the Castro uh, uh, want him, nor the Russians want him alive talking to anybody. Do you have, uh, is this speculation or do you have proof of this communication? I think it's pretty clear. 
I'll let uh, I'm I have stayed away in the book, and I will stay away from words uh, words like uh, absolutely clear and 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 so forth. But I think both motivation and the uh, geography of where people were uh, point very clearly toward uh, uh, Ruby uh, killing uh, Oswald and having uh, done so. Uh, because the Russians and the uh, and the uh, Cubans uh, didn't want uh, uh, him or anybody uh, to know what he was uh, what he was doing. Um, you know, are you a sports fan? Are you someone who likes sports? I I have gone both ways. Uh, when the Redskins were were here, I went to almost every game. Um, uh, other uh, sports, I I. I Tend toward baseball, but uh, that's gone on evil days as a result of the virus. Uh, so as soon as baseball comes back in a sensible way, I'll be out there in the stadiums. So, so you, you know how a kid is raised in a family in Boston and he grows up hating the Yankees, right? Yeah. And he's five years old sitting next to his daddy and he's just watching the, oh my gosh, that's a D. You know what? They're, 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 these Yankees are con artists. And a kid grows up 30 years later, these Yankees are con artists. And then his kid and, you know, generationally, they hate the Yankees. And it stays with them from a kid till later on, even 70 years old, they still hate the Yankees. Magic till today, when he hears about the Celtics, his body shivers because he can't stand the Celtics because it was his number one enemy, right? And you go on and on and on and on and on. How much of you, you know, uh, uh, knowing when you were coming up, you know, enemy, the state number one was Russia. Fast forward today, how much of it has to do with you just despise Russia, where you think they would be capable of taking out Kennedy because you had aspirations of Kennedy because you're a conservative Democrat? And how much is it just logically you said, you know what, I just want to write a book about this because I'm certain Lee Harvey Oswald was behind the assassination of Kennedy? None of the above. Um, I uh, uh, went into the world of national security through uh, interest and developed I was uh, uh, working on the reconnaissance satellite uh, stuff for the Pentagon. Um, uh, that was uh, two, two, two and a half years of basically technical research and understanding uh, how the satellites uh, work and so on. Um, I. Uh, I didn't uh, feel a, an emotional uh, requirement to uh, do anything for the Russians. I, I, as a matter of fact, um, when I negotiated the Conventional Forces in Europe uh, treaty back in uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, late uh, uh, 80s, um, I um, uh, got along reasonably well uh, with the Russians. Uh, they, uh, they were... Uh, uh, not my favorites, but uh, I could uh, get along with them and uh, and and did. Well, what was the fabric of doing business with Russians? Like, what did you know they stood for? Dot dot dot. Here's what it was: doing business with Russians. The thing that I found to be their saving grace, in a sense, was that they had a good sense of. A lot of times, they had good senses of humor. I often look at people's senses of humor to make temporary. Uh, judgments and um, the Russians, on the whole, had pretty good senses of humor. I, my German friends in the negotiations uh, uh, didn't so much, <laughs> but my uh, my Russian acquaintances, um, I uh, I could get along with, um, and uh, in all of those cases, uh, the, the the best. Humor was certainly British. I mean, the Brits just do that well. Um, so, uh, but I, uh, but I, I did uh, get along with the, uh, the Russians, uh, okay. And uh, uh, I, I, neither sports nor that was really central to my uh, decision making. I, I would do my best to uh, have decisions come through uh, in a way that let me uh, uh, have a lighthearted demeanor in dealing with the 27 countries that I had to, to deal with. And uh, uh, I always tried to 
pay people compliments and so forth uh, to keep things on an even keel. So who told who told dirtier jokes, British or the Germans? <laughs> Actually, British or the Russians? This is a diplomatic uh, uh, corps. Uh, they, they were not 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 good with dirty jokes. Although I, I think probably the the, the best ones uh, would probably have been Russian. I can see that somehow. I can say. So were you a big Reagan fan with him telling his sense of humor, constantly telling jokes from stage? Well, I didn't really know Reagan. I I I worked. He was one of the four presidents I worked for, uh, and I enjoyed my one or two meetings with him. But I I didn't know his personality or his personal style. I was uh, uh, the head of a negotiating team. I was uh, uh, not. Uh, a close confidant of the presidents. Last question for you before we wrap up. If you were the enemy today, okay, say Russia comes to you with a blank check. They said, James, um, we're going to give you a billion dollars. China's going to give you a billion dollars. Iran's going to give you a billion dollars. Tell us what is the best way to attack America today. What would you say it is? Excuse me, I'll... Uh, uh talk to you tomorrow and then I go right to <laughs> and say, I'm going in to see a Russian who's uh, pitched me uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, how do you want me to handle it? I'll uh, either play the game with them or I'll just uh, say, go to hell. But uh, uh, if you want me to uh, lead them astray, let me know. I respect that. I respect that. You know, the, the, but, but did you, do you, and you don't even have to answer this. I'm just curious uh, uh, asking you this question. Would you know the best way to internally destroy America? And if yes, is it in the progress of that becoming a reality and we have to fight like hell to keep it? Or no, the strategy you have, no one's talking about it. I think that uh, the thing that uh, would probably uh, uh, influence not me, but a, but a potential person like, who, like Ames, decided to go with the Russians because of money. I think the thing that would most influence somebody uh, like that uh, would be um, his effort uh, probably to please his wife and family and children and just stack up money. I mean, if he can, without people knowing about it, if he could stack up tens of millions of dollars enough to lead a very wealthy life, that would be the kind of person I think that would be most likely to, uh, to turn uh, to the Russians. Uh, the ideological folks who want to have a, Lee Harvey Oswald type life and climb onto the ladder of the arriving aircraft coming back to Moscow and getting cheers and, and everybody loving them. That, that set of motivations, um, I think it'd be pretty hard for folks to come to now. If only because uh, it's hard to uh, find uh, people who are uh, uh, going to make decisions based on something like that because they're afraid to get caught. Uh, but um, I don't think there are that many Americans that would uh, uh, go uh, the, the route of, of uh, uh, leaning on the, the, the Russians uh, for the future. Uh, there might be a few that would lean on uh, a uh, Russian ideology as well has happened over history with a, a range of, uh, of uh, people that uh, uh, took mainly payment in, in affection and, 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 uh, uh, and desire like uh, uh, like Oswald. So uh, I don't know. Uh, 
I, I think it might be more likely to uh, find a Chinese who was willing to do that because I think the numbers are so huge uh, that the possibility they would uh, come across uh, someone who was uh, willing to take uh, either funds or uh, 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 ideology in a sense uh, as their payment uh, it could be a, a pretty substantial number of people. I don't know if the Chinese would because the Chinese, even if they pay you and you turned against them, the government would take out your family's life. They would, the fear of taking out your life. Americans, if you turn against the country, the government's not coming out of your family because the government would still keep your family intact. China, they, if you cross the country, the country's above the individual. Yes. And America at least gives you a little bit protection of the individual that even if you cross the line. So that's why I think It'd be easier to turn against America than it would be to turn against China. Again, I'm, I'm just a business guy. I'm just speculating. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm not the one that's the director of CIA here. I'm the one that's interviewing the director of CIA. So uh, I uh, think you uh, this country is, in spite of our recent chaos, is, uh, uh, I think, on balance, uh, pretty likely to go to the FBI. Um, uh, compared to, to most uh, uh, I agree. institutions and groups. I, I, I totally, you know, I asked the question from you only because when I sit there and I strategize with my board or with my executives and I ask, you know, the question comes up about if we were our own enemy and number one competitor, how would we try to hurt us? You have to think about that. You have to ask that question because you learn that way. I asked that question because I would hope, you know, and I would assume this is happening. The folks in charge of the CIA, the, the whatever the, uh, organizations that are out there that are trying to protect the country, they asked the question, if the enemy wanted to take out America, how would you go about doing it? You know, what would that strategy be? Because that would be what I would be spending my time having almost like a blanket insurance policy around it to make sure that never happened. And how I go about doing that would be you know, the, the right execution. I'll tell you one, because I got clearance from the CIA because I was writing an op-ed uh, um, some months ago. Uh, I got clearance from them to uh, write this up and have it published. So I, I've got to say, I think it would be pretty effective, which is to put um, uh, into a uh, early old division uh, uh, electromagnetic pulse um, uh, warhead, a um, uh, EMP uh, a warhead that could be detonated at a low uh, level, that could be detonated um, with um, um, uh, a uh, uh, device that uh, um, was a simple one, uh, like pretty much like the, dev the nuclear device that ex yep. was exploded that we used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. First time that was brought up was by Newt Gingrich, by the way, in the 2011 or 2012 debate when he brought up the EMP. And everybody was like, what the hell is an EMP? It yeah. had been around for a while, but no one, when they asked what's the biggest threat, everybody gave the general answer. And then Newt Gingrich shocked the whole world. Then everybody started Googling EMP. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Uh, he and I have been on panels together and stuff writing about this. But the, the bottom line, is just detonate a, a low yield nuclear uh, uh, device, um, and uh, uh, you want to do it up at least, let's say, uh, a mile or two. Uh, you could probably still have an effect if you detonated it um, up uh, several miles, and it would um, take out pretty much uh, all of the. Uh, uh, electromagnetic devices, uh, including uh, the, uh, the uh, um, um, the uh, uh, um, yeah, what am I thinking of? Uh, the phone towers, the servers, the internet, the uh, electricity. Yeah, all of those, uh, but also the electric grid, if uh, you may have mentioned it, it, it that takes everything. Uh, within limits. Uh, and so being able to uh, detonate a, an EMP uh, is uh, potentially devastating.
Well, uh, hopefully everyone's going to play nice. You know, hopefully everyone's going to play nice and hopefully everyone's rather than thinking about attacking each other, they're playing a nice game of solitary or backgammon or spades or dominoes or whatever their choice and preferences of playing a game. But uh, knowing when you're competing in the game of power, unfortunately, they're spending more time thinking about tactics and strategies yep. of protecting themselves against the war than worried about who's going to get the highest score on backgammon or solitary. So maybe what we have to do is instead of sending that EMP, we send the biggest distraction of video games, you know, movies, shows to distract the hell out of these leaders. So they're consuming more entertainment than you know, going out there thinking about attacking each other. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, maybe I watch too much cartoons with my kids and my, my mind is going into cartoon strategies than actually real life strategies. You, you realize that uh, uh, we're being saved from the evil cartoons uh, by uh, um, just as of yesterday, uh, they're taking uh, the um, uh, Bugs Bunny. Off, I saw that. Uh, taking um, uh Oh, half a dozen of the key characters because we're doing the evil thing by watching them with our kids sometimes. You know, the whole Dr. Seuss and Pierce Morgan yesterday got canceled. Yeah. So what, what, as a conservative Democrat, what do you think about the cancel culture? Absolutely idiotic. Really? So you don't you don't agree with the fact that we cancel what people say that could potentially hurt someone else's feelings? That's right. My response to that when I hear it is almost always get a life. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely one of the scariest thing that's happening because it's the ultimate muzzle. You know, I left Iran living in a country with a big muzzle where you can't even think negative thoughts about the country. And then you come to America that handcuff shackles and muzzles back on just in a different way. And you can only listen to one way of thinking, not the other way. So yep. who knows what's going to happen? Uh, uh, look, uh, I got to tell you, I enjoyed it. I uh, 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 got smarter. I learned more uh, of whether if I ever get the call to want to be the director of CIA to turn it down indefinitely <laughs> and, you know, stick to what I'm doing for a living. And uh, for everybody that's watching this, uh, 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 James, we're going to put the link to your book below that folks can go order, specifically those of you that are very, very curious about the JFK assassination. Highly recommend you go get the book and read it for yourself. And if you agree or disagree, tell us about it. But uh, with that being said, once again, sir, thank you so much for making the time for being a guest on Valuetainment. Many thanks. Appreciate it very much. Great interview. Appreciate you. Thank you. So many different versions of the JFK assassination story. What was your biggest takeaway? And as well as what it meant to be a director of CIA, any of the strategies when he and I talked about as a conservative Democrat, how he viewed different topics. I just want to hear your thoughts. And if you enjoyed this interview, I think, I think, I think you'll enjoy a short clip of an interview I did with uh, Jim Jenkins, who was in the autopsy room, one of only four people who held John F. Kennedy's brain. And this is what he saw in the autopsy room, watch this short clip. Something tells me after you watch this short clip, you're going to want to watch the entire interview. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.